If Murray had supported the show, I'd be less sick of podcasts. Yeah, there goes. The blubbity blah. Sending out good vibes. Shivers or vibrations and stuff like that. America. One of the things that I think a lot of the more modern researchers do awful quickly is they come up with a theory before they have too much evidence. Okay, guys, welcome back to the Grand America Show. Uh, we're going to be chatting with Lauren Coleman a little bit later. A long time coming. Can't believe it took seven years. We actually, I was looking through the chats. We're going to have Lauren Coleman on like seven years ago. So we're seven years late. We finally rescheduled and had him on the show. It was a fun chat. Good chat. He's got his museum up there looking for cryptids. Bigfoot guy. I'm getting some Bigfoot. You Bigfoot people will be happy. Finally getting your Bigfoot episode. The ghost people still be upset. We don't. We don't really. We really don't do too much ghosts no, around let's here. Let's do some ghosts. There's Graham Ghost Dunlop. We could do more ghost stuff. There's ghosts this place. It was Halloween. Yeah, yeah. They, well, the ghost stuff just doesn't do it for me. Really? It's just no. It's not my thing. We did do it not too long ago. I, I remember where it's probably last last spring or something. Last, uh, yeah. Well. Their time is just crazy with the whole, with everything that's going on. You could count on one hand the number of ghost shows we've done for sure. We've done some spirit yeah. shows or some yeah, poltergeist kind of shows. blends in and stuff. But, well, let's do it. We'll do another one one day. Who's a soon. good ghost person? We need people to send in their ghost recommendations. Or ghost stories. Ooh, that'd be good. Because here's the thing, like the only ghost people I know are like the people with the dorky ghost shows maybe or the like. Yeah. Zach Baggins is one of the guys that we were going to have on years ago and it just never happened. Yeah, I think he said, yeah, pretty- he was going to come on, but he ended up getting super famous, I think, with yeah. his little show. Yeah, yeah. We didn't, so. <laughs> Good. Okay. Yeah. We'd be canceled if we were, anyways. Or. It wouldn't have lasted. We'd be making big bucks to just push the narrative. <laughs> <laughs> Living large. <laughs> Would you do it? No. No? No. Never sell out? No, nah, not now. Uh, well, and. No, oh. I don't think so. So I flew to BC and back. Okay, so we're going to talk about this. <laughs> Just so you know, I got a couple of quick emails. All I right. got an operation project for you and a little bit of a sound bite for uh, this cryptid episode. I'll need the clip cord a little later. No, no. It's what a listener sent us, uh, that how to hunt guy who talks about Sasquatch in the woods all the time. So how to hunt little- Sasquatch? I haven't even listened to it yet, so it's going to be blind. This is going to be a blind clip. You can't just do blind I can do clips. what how I can want. You just, how can you just, like, you don't even know what it is? Because I trust our listeners. And I listened to, like, the first 10 seconds of it. I thought, okay, I'm going to back. See, this is the problem. You only read the headline. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've watched this guy before lots of times. I think he's a Canadian how to hunt guy. Actually, you'd probably like his channel. I think so. Yeah. Anyways. I digress. And then uh, project operation. What else am I going to say? Oh, and I got a quote in the book. And then right, well, uh, so for people first? for people that are new, just listening to Lauren Coleman, like our interview starts in maybe 30, 45 minutes. There's a timestamp in the show notes. This is where we get listeners involved with some emails and some ramblings, maybe some social media or maybe Darren's funny some stories and voicemails. Is there? Yeah. Well, now we got too much content for this. Oh, intro, so I'll have to save. What if she, what do you, you go first. No, no. I want to hear your story. So you're Mr. Anti. Are you anti-mask or do you have a disability that I'm not allowed to ask about? I have a disability. What? I have a disability. Okay. So you're not yeah. anti-mask or are you both? I'm anti-me Can you wearing be both? a mask. Can you be both? You're not I'm anti other people. Other people. <laughs> I mean, some of these people should be wearing masks. <laughs> let's be honest. Why? Well. What do you mean? Some people look better with a mask. Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Crazy. Um. No, I'm not anti-mask. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's real good for you. I personally don't want to wear one, but I don't really care. I don't. I'm not. I don't like that they're forcing people. I'm anti-mask mandate. Yeah, 
I'm not against masks. If people want to wear masks, that's fine. Yeah, it's coming. It's kind of like, worse and worse. I don't think people should smoke, but I'm not anti smoking yeah. or anti drinking or, you know. I feel like every week we're like, okay, mask mandates have been in, cases are going up, these supposed cases. And are the masks working? Like, how do people think these are working? I can't fathom it myself. I look, just go to Tony Heller. I'm going to put a little note in the show notes here. Tony Heller's got some great, great deconstructions of the masks and the the places that, you know, are doing better are the ones that didn't have the mandates. And Sweden. Oh, and you you wouldn't think it. If you I'm just if people Alberta's don't know what Sweden really it. happened in Sweden, the, you know? Because it looks like more lockdowns are coming. I'm just hoping 70 doctors going to Sweden it. 70 doctors, apparently, this is just from a friend, said, are, are pushing our premier to do a sharp lockdown. Like a sharp, sharp, sharp. Sharp. No, what's that? I'm trying to do the Pink Floyd lyric and I can't even. Shock? Yeah. Shock lockdown? Short, sharp, shock. Shock and shot, awe? Yeah. <sighs> shock and awe, wasn't that like the yeah, thing they, they called yeah. it when they attacked Iraq? So they want a sharp <laughs> lockdown to get rid of this. I mean, do they even understand that the, the way this thing is expressing itself through the PCR tests or like. I don't it, That it's not going to do it? That a lockdown is really not going to help, I don't think. It's probably going to destroy more people. I mean, can, do, does anybody want to look at the real data from Sweden? I do. Not really. I'd like you to look at it and tell me about it. Uh, you won't believe me. Then. But I want, no, I'll believe me if you look at the data. You believe me? You, I'll, I'll believe, believe me. you. I'll believe you. If you look at the data and tell me. Or if you look at one person looking at the data. But I won't believe you if you tell me about a guy whose cousin, whose uncles, whose thing read a website where they read the data and then shared it on Instagram. Yeah, that's that's fine. Okay. I, 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 yeah. I look at the real stats too, you know, the real official stats. You go to the link? What? You like go to the link? No, I'm not, I got, you know, I the, know. The, COVID, the official COVID data, right? I'm just busting It shows balls. you that Sweden's not any worse than oh, 30 yeah, of no, the, 30 saw, of the yeah. Western countries. I'm with you on that. I'm with you. I want to move there. Are you? I don't think you are. I have Norwegian. Do I have, don't I have Scandinavian blood in me? Like 1.2%. Or <laughs> that won't that get me. Maybe you could emigrate there. <sighs> but Anyways, I mean, you might okay. not like it there. Okay, let's talk about your mask experience. It was no mask experience. So you flew. I flew. Locally, kind of, in, in within the, the Western Canada. Like jump provinces. Jump provinces without a mask. Yeah. The whole way. Did you put, you put, you haven't put a mask on no. in like months. Probably. So I, I'll, I bought a mask because I, I had to go. So I was like, okay, I'm going to put this in my carry on because I'm like, I, I'll be honest. I wasn't willing to fucking die on the, die. I wasn't willing to die on the mask hill, like for a flight. Like I wasn't willing to not fly on that plane over the mask. Oh, I see. I'd like to say I was, yeah, but that yeah, would have maybe. disrupted my life in all sorts of terrible ways. So I just, it wasn't an option if it didn't work. I hate to even admit that I, I had a mask to back down. No, but, I know. I know. But, but I mean, we all, we all understand. There was a real, yeah. there was a real thing. So I went up to, to security and uh, he's like, you need a mask. And I was like, listen, I was like, I'm not wearing a mask. I've got a thing. And, uh, and he's like, no, no, you, he's like, go talk to your airline. You're not, you're not coming on. No. Is this before you, so you got a ticket already with the airline? Like you yeah, checked well, in? I just went and checked my, cause Calgary gives you the option just checking yourself in. Oh, cause you had so no luggage. So you machine. just went, you had no luggage. So go, you can just walk. Yeah, you don't I just have my carry on. Yeah. I go, the security guy right away. No, you're not getting by me without a mask. I'm like, well, I'm not wearing a mask. And, uh, I was like, if it's like, I was like, I've got an exemption. You know, I'm just, I'm not wearing a mask. I've, and he's like, well, I've got a note. So I show him the note and he's like, no, no, no. And then he calls the manager. You had the over. physical note? No, I just oh, had it on my phone. You didn't take the physical note no. with you. Why? So I had the physical note in my truck. I printed out like six copies of it. So um, I photocopied it a bunch. You need a bunch of copies of this thing. I have, one, I have the originals hanging up in my office, I think, at work. But... I have a bunch of copies in my truck, but by the time I got to the airport, you know me, I'm running late. And they say, oh if you're not there 45 minutes early, then no, you're not flying. 
So I'm there. I'm like an hour early, but I'm just scrambling a little bit. So I just, I forget. I go in, I check myself in. I always forget that the airport's like fucking deserted now. So really you just like walk in. There's no one at security. So right away the security guards, no. I show him the note. He's like, no. And he's like, flags his manager over. So she comes over and she's like, no, I need to wear a mask. Or you need a doctor's note. And I'm like, well, I got the note. So she takes my phone, wanders off for a while. And I'm like, oh, she took my phone. Weird. Anyway, she comes back like 10 minutes later and she's like, okay, come on. So she like follows me through and she has to like tell the like the first lady takes my temperature and asks me some questions. And <clears throat> she has to tell her why I'm not wearing a mask. And then we go around to the next place where I'm going to take my shoes and stuff off. And they made me wait there for some reason. Like I was constantly waiting for this to blow up in my face because I don't know. I just don't know how it's going to go. I'm like, this is like, it was very much similar to the first non-mask experiences where you're anxious and your, your fucking pulses up a little bit. So I'm like waiting and she's like, well, wait here. <clears throat> so then she pushed me ahead. Hope I didn't get COVID. Hope you didn't cough like that. While you're waiting. I was really careful. I made sure I brought water on the plane so I didn't cough. I was like, this is the fucking last thing I need, right? <laughs> you get one of your allergy attacks, start sneezing. Yeah. Of- <laughs> oh, my God. So then I got to security, and I had to wait because the lady had only a mask on. And I guess since I didn't have a mask, she had to put on a face shield as well. So she had to go put on her face shield before she could look at my boarding pass and put my luggage through or my carry on of my jacket and stuff through the x-ray machine. And then the guy that was on the other side of the x-ray machine also had to put on the, a face shield and a mask to deal with me. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, okay. And then they just turn me loose. So then it's like weird. Cause I'm like walking through the airport. I'm the only one. Like this is the first time I've been the only one I'm used to. There's always a couple, you know, there's like one or two other people wandering around without a mask, especially if you get in a big crowd, then you're like walking past gate after gate and people are like looking at you. Really? Oh yeah. Like it was like, people are looking and I'm like, okay, this is awkward. You so should I, just put your hands up. And like... <laughs> I go and buy some, I always tell you, keep in the back of my head. I'm like 30% of these people hate masks. I just keep that in the back of my head that there's like one in three of these people are just doing it because they, it's easier. Um, and they don't care. But then there's also like, I'm also thinking there's like a, there's a percentage of these people that are looking at me like a real fucking biohazard right now. <laughs> so anyway, I go and I buy a water and I go and sit off by my own there and I'm getting in line to board. And that's where the lady's coming along, checking temperatures. And she's like, no, no, you need a mask. I'm like, I got a note. She checks. Let me see. Checks my note. Okay. So she lets me buy. And then I get to the spot where I got to show my ID and she's like, you need a, you need a note or you need a mask. And I'm like, I got a note. I've been like telling everyone they let me this far. (laughs) (laughs) And so she's like, well, just show me something. And I'm like, so I show her my phone. She's like, okay. So then I get on the plane and I sit down beside buddy and like right away, um, the stewardess comes over. She's like, oh, we're going to sit you on your own. (laughs) So I go over, I got Was there a lot of people on the plane? Enough. Like half full? Probably three quarters full. Three quarters, wow. Yeah, on the way there is three quarters full. And they're all masked. So everybody on the plane's got a mask on. Yeah. And they think this is helping. I don't know what they think. I'm not in there. I'm just, I'm just being. So then they, so uh, they moved me to my own row. Got a whole row all to myself. Most of the other plane was doubled up and I have a row to myself. A whole row. I don't have a mask. <laughs> they all have to sit closer <laughs> together. And, yeah. and then, uh, so the plane's good. I took a picture of myself on the plane. Oh, I know. I got him. And then I uh, got off the plane. We land in Kamloops. I get off the plane. And you, like, land outside. There's no, like, terminal to walk into. You're, like, just getting out on the tarmac. And the lady at the bottom of the tarmac's like, where's your mask? You need a mask. Is this because of, <laughs> is this, is the tarmac landing because of COVID? No, it's just oh. a tiny little airport. Oh, okay, okay, There's yeah, just no, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. And she's like, you need a mask. And I'm like, I just got off the plane without a mask. You think I just like took it off? Like I, I got to know. I'm exempt. She's like, oh, okay. Walk like 10 more feet to the guy that's holding the door open. You need a mask to go in the airport. I'm just like, oh my God. So anyway, that was the end of that. Okay. Then I went to the hotel and the lady's like, are you here to go to the job site? I'm like, yeah. She's like, once you go there, you can't come back. (laughs) And I'm like, what? She's like, because of the breakout. She's like, you just leave your key in your room. And I'm like, oh, okay. 
And then, but she wasn't wearing a mask because she has asthma. There you go. Yeah. But she was smart. Very, very, very COVID scared. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh. They are, uh, yeah, she was talking about the breakout. And then the whole BC, the whole town scene on edge, the job site was super on edge. They didn't like me. And then uh, on the way back was a little bit different. Because on the way back, I had to go. There's no, the airport's so small, there's no, like. Social distancing? No, there's no fucking keypad to just punch in on my own. Oh, so you pass. had to go to the so counter. I had to go to the counter. <laughs> and uh, she's like, you need a mask. <laughs> Or face cover. No, you need a mask. Straight up, you need a mask. It can't even be a scarf or something. It's got to be a mask. And I'm like, I got a note. And I show her my phone. She's like, no, no, it's got to be a physical note. You can't, you can't just show me your phone. And I'm like, well, I've worked on the way here, like through Calgary. And she's like, ah, let me just put a note on your file. So then she's like, give me back your phone. So like, Click, click, click. Anti-masker. Puts a note Masker. on my file. And then after that, so she's like, I go to go through security and she's like, he's got, an, or the lady that takes my shoes and stuff is like, you need a mask. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like so close to the West Jet lady. She comes around. She's like, he's got a note. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So I'm like, she's like, let me see. I got to see it. So then I show her the note. And then the two other security guys, the one guy's mask like down under his nose. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's like, I got to see the note. I've never seen a note before. <laughs> so then he comes over and then I'm like, they all look at my note. They're all touching my phone, passing my phone around. <laughs> and then I go through the thing and he, they, he had to swab my hands because I got random swab checked or whatever. And then his boss came over and gave him shit. I'm just going to put a note in your file on that. His boss came over and gave him shit because he didn't put on the face shield before he dealt with me. Wow. But he's like, well, it's my first non-mask. <laughs> Did he say that? <laughs> yeah. No, he's a non-mask virgin. Yeah. So then I go and I walk into this, like, it's like just one big gate there. Was so he, he joking? Was he kind of like. No, he was like, just telling me and him were kind or? of like joking with each other. There was like some joke there. There was a chemistry or whatever. Did you, you have your be good to people hat yeah. on? <laughs> no, no. I was wearing my uh, okay. gun hat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. Sorry, we're not laughing just so people know. Like, we no, but buddy, you know, buddy it's not like we think this is all we're getting along, yeah. And uh, but his boss came over, it wasn't bad, he didn't get reprimanded. He's like, You gotta wear the shield on, buddy. And he's like, This is my first guy. And I'm out. So then I walk in, it's like one giant gate, so there's like 200 people in this room, and I gotta go like sit off in the corner. I'm the only person without a mask, and I'm sitting over there, and uh, I can. People, this, people are like talking about me. This couple's like looking at me, talking about me, whispering. And then the WestJet lady comes over and I'm like, oh boy, <laughs> here we go. But she's got a new boarding pass for me because <laughs> they've decided to move me to the middle of the plane <laughs> where they can have the front. They've like re-maneuvered the plane to keep me. So I had nobody like within a couple rows of me on the way back. <laughs> there was me with my own row, an empty row in front of me and an empty row behind me. Wow. And, uh, so after that, I had to like wait in line and like, but going forward from that, they, everybody seemed to know about me. They could see me coming without my mask. And the one lady was like, oh, you're my exemption. <laughs> so I just thought it was kind of funny on the way back. They were like, they were expecting me on the way back on the way there. They weren't. But now that there's a note on my file, I think they're like, oh, we have this like guy's, oh, you're an exemption. Hey, a non-masker coming We have an through. exemption they're, coming They were calling through. me an exemption. So they're like, oh, you're my exemption. <laughs> oh, my God. And honestly, it seemed like uh, they seemed, they weren't, not, none of the people on the way back were like standoffish about it. They were a little more standoffish going through Calgary. On the way back, everyone just seemed kind of, um, I don't know, just kind of confused by the whole thing. Yeah, just yeah. like dumbstruck, maybe. Yeah. The balls on this guy. So it was fun. It was a neat experience. Yeah, totally. I can tell. And I just want I people to know. I like, don't look flying again. Like, no, no. It wasn't I just, fun. I'm not looking forward to it by any means. I can see it's going to be a pain in the ass every time. Yeah. But I also think I'm going to get my own row every time. Yeah, there you like, go. This is going to be a thing. I'm yeah. never, I might as well just buy the cheap middle seat because they're going to just move me to the middle and I'll just sit in the window anyway. Yeah. Or the aisle, or a lie down, or whatever the fuck. So all that. I think the U.S. might have a different policy. They might drag me off that motherfucker. 
So people are people eating and drinking on the plane without their mask? Like yeah, how do the they, how do they how do they consume the how do they very, consume the mask things? edited on the plane was quite slack. Yeah. I gotta say a lot of masks under chins will you know oh, just under so, noses. I just want people to know we're not laughing because we think was, this is all a big joke or anything like that. We do take it we take it seriously. We just don't agree with I mean, I'll, I'm not going to speak for Darren, but I just don't agree with the way things are being handled with this whole thing. So, just so people know, I think it's mostly a scam. Yeah, the masks are a joke. Yeah, the, well, the mask. Yeah, well, the mask thing for sure. I mean, if people think that their breathing is just being contained within their little mask and there's no aerosolized particles going anywhere, they're, you know, it's kind of crazy to me, especially the evidence showing that they're doing a damn good job, aren't they, so far? <clears throat> Yeah. So yeah, that was it. it was, uh, yeah. I feel like I'm like, there's not a lot of people that have flown lately without a mask. I gotta say, I was like, when I finally got back and got in my truck, I was kind of, and everything was done and settled and you know, I couldn't help but smirk. <laughs> <laughs> what a guy. Uh. It's funny because my, my ex-wife, when I picked up the kids was like, you're always good at fucking getting what you want. <laughs> it's good. I'm stubborn. Sometimes you have to be stubborn. Yeah. I feel like I've, I, my stubbornness is working to my advantage on this. Yeah, definitely. It needs to. Sometimes you got to just draw a line. Well, and maybe it's showing some people that they can also stand up. I mean, I, I keep going back to Rye. Rye was in a shop, my buddy, and uh, without a mask, and two people took off their mask while he was there, you know? so Nobody on the plane took off their mask. I know. This is too bad. So my sister's getting, um, I don't know if it's her building, but I think it's happening in Vancouver. There's a big lockdown happening, and I don't know if it's province-wide or city-wide, or it might be just in downtown Vancouver, that you're not allowed to visit other people unless they're in your bubble. If Like, maybe a caretaker. But then the rules were, were refined a little bit to say, you can have your little bubble of one or two people. That's it. No visiting. Is that like a rule or a suggestion? I don't know. Because I noticed Alberta came out with a new restriction. And again, it's the one that I do think they can force is the gatherings. And then they say suggested things is masks in workplace, public or not, was a suggestion. So they're basically suggesting that employers mandate masks for the workers. And the other one was limit to three cohorts. Does a family member count as cohort? Yeah, I think so. I mean, so that's pretty much the same thing, except it's three instead of two. And that's the suggestion, right? <clears throat> Damn shame. I don't know, dude. It's uh, At least Alberta feels like they're trying to slowly push back a little bit. We I'm are we supposedly the the freest of the provinces yet, I think. and they're But they're getting some pushback. I mean, 70 doctors want the sharp shock shark, the oh. short sharp, sharp shock. Nice. Okay. I got a couple emails to read. What sort of emails? Just feedback. All right. Let's go with. Not bad. And now another edition of the Grime American Goodies by the people. By the people. This is from Odin. He says, uh, <clears throat> Hey guys, I've been a supporter for a while. Anyways, I love the show and love the balance you guys have struck between the weird and the COVID. It feels tricky at the moment as we are all burnt out by it, but also it behooves us to stay informed about the how it's all playing out for the cacistocracy ruled by the shittest. Personally, I am confident that we'll come out the other side of this with greater freedom and sovereignty, but it's going to get worse before it finally gets better. The beast is dying, but an animal in its most, is its most dangerous in its death throes, and there are many who would love to take a lot of us out as they try to consolidate control. To my mind, a lot of this has rested on the vaccine push, but that's looking more and more tenuous as the wheels fall off that deadly bus. Thank God. So keep on keeping on, and cheers for all you guys do. No so, bango. Thanks, buddy. Love getting those emails. Got another one here quickly. Dear Darren and Graham, or Graham and Darren, I appreciate you guys, even when your opinion isn't the same as mine. 
if everything you said in your podcast was exactly in agreement with me, then I would never learn anything. I don't contribute because you rubber stamp my opinions. I contribute because you explore the world as you see it. The title of this email is call it like you see it. By now, everyone has heard the corporate media have declared that Kamala Harris is the next president. Everyone says Biden is there, but we know he's not really there. I wonder if COVID will be retired or if it will be the new reason why the globalists get to dump their debt on the middle class and steal their productivity to further enrich themselves. Only time will tell. Hope you guys keep telling it like you see it, especially when you disagree with my opinions. That was from Chris. Thanks, Chris. Awesome feedback, eh? Yeah. Is that it? That's it for the feedbacks, yeah? I got some texts. Okay. Oh, boy. Did I already read? Okay, first of all, what's your opinion on this? That is the big question. So if Biden comes out of this, is it going to be full-blown lockdown, try the sharp, sharp shock for this, too? And then is COVID going to disappear and he's the hero that saved everybody and the lockdowns solved it all? Or is it just going to be, like, perpetual? I think it's up to the people. Oh, my God. Come on, dude. I really do. I think if people keep putting up with it, then it's just going to... Well, let's assume they're putting up with it. Then it's just going to get worse. Even with Biden? He's not going to be the hero that stopped it all via lockdown? I think there's too much... uh, At stake? They've gone too far? People are making too much money now. I think people are making too much money. There's going to be a ton of pushback from pharma that is probably like selling vaccines like a motherfucker right now. Like, there's places in BC that are mandating flu shots. No. Yeah. We can talk about it after. I can't get into it on the show. Okay. Um, so I think vaccine sales are at an all-time high. I really do. I think they're selling vaccines like a motherfucker, and they're getting money from governments like a motherfucker, and they want to keep that going. And I and just they- think the delivery companies and the Amazons and the, you know, Amazon and these tech companies also own your news companies. Amazon's trying to buy CNN. They already own the Washington Post. You got billionaires that own news companies now, and they're making a lot of money off people working from home or staying at home and ordering out or whatever, you know, fill in the blank. Amazon's like, what, almost doubled in value? Well, that kind of gets to the intentional demolition of the economy. Yeah. By, you know, the small businesses that are toast and... uh. And there's also Europe. Europe is pushing back quite a bit. Like, I think they've gone too far with the lockdowns and everything. Like, just to back off right now quickly because Biden's president. I mean, I, I, I'm not That's sure. That's what I mean by up, by up to the people. Like, I think Europe's going to get out of it by pushing back. They, they don't much. seem to put up with as much as we do. We're just, we're just okay. sheeple over here. Anyways, go ahead. All right. What do we got? Uh, pew, pew. That's like a stock. Okay. Recent listener to your show here. Not sure if this is the best way to contact you. I think now more than ever, it is obvious that like-minded people need to find ways to connect and organize. Your show is helping to do that. I believe it is also crucial to teach self-sufficiency. I've been compelled to be self-sufficient my entire life. To that point, I built a house on a truck from scratch and I've been traveling the continent 48 years, living off grid and working under the table. All the tools I need to build additional truck houses are stored with me, and I travel with them. I can live anywhere and work without grid access, including welding everything. I just bought property in eastern Oregon, and I tend to start a building selling truck houses and converted vehicles to the end of enabling others to become self-sufficient. I don't know if that's something you're interested or not, but I wanted to say I will contribute to my show and make myself available to anyone resisting the forces of globalism and slavery by debt. Wow, fantastic, <clears throat> fantastic text. Hey, guys, just wanted to let you guys know you're doing a great job. Love to be able to listen to you guys and get away from the craziness that is the world now. It's hard to find a lot of open thinkers down here in South Florida, so being able to get away and have you guys to listen to and almost connect with is priceless, fellas. I got to start supporting you guys some more. Plus, I know I would love that black budget stuff. Again, thanks for podcasting. Keep up the great work. Peace and love, Marcel. And I told him to email you for the link. I don't know if he did or not. Uh, Maybe. I'm trying to keep up on emails. Actually, emails have been increasing quite a bit lately. I don't know why that is. Usually they... 
We got this one. Great show, boys, from the listener in the swing state of Pennsylvania. I was a volunteer on election day as a oh. watcher canvassing mail-in no. ballots. This is for public transparency. In the middle of the night, the state advised all counting would stop and start again in the morning. I had this morning. I had some friends, including an attorney for the local GOP, saying today they were being denied access to the areas where ballots are actually being counted and when they when they were promised access. Similar stories are coming from Michigan, Wisconsin, and others. Massive fraud and discrepancies in swing states. Oh, yeah. That was I on would Wednesday. I would agree with that. Oh, and then I sent that to you. That's Whether something ever to happens you. to it, or, you know. Then I think we got a couple of voicemails here as well. Oh, wow. We're killing it. Yeah, see, it's good to give out that. Please what's... enter your password. Oh, boy. This is, see, and, you, and you're, you you're upset at me message. for cold. To check unheard messages, press 1-1. One, one. Main men, first unheard message. And you're just going to listen to it. You haven't even listened to this yet. Hopefully I paid the Hey, guys, this is Vegas or uh, Snooze Dragon in the, um, Chats. in the chat. I, I posted a message to uh, Stan Fran yesterday, which um, I know you guys are busy. I haven't gotten to yet. But uh, I'm really into cryptocurrencies. I've been watching the uh, NFTs on fungible tokens, and um, they're putting a lot of art and things on them. And some people are putting music on them now. So I was going through the numbers of it and seeing if you could put podcasts on them. Because then there would be like, uh, well, if the company goes under, then there's nothing. But <clears throat> just another form of backup for the podcast, unfortunately, to, to uh, work the contract, like a $7 fee. Oh, uh, for me to make one, um, I made one out of the Pam Popper episode, um, but the only way I could get the whole thing to fit was to totally destroy the quality or to cut it into sections, but that doesn't work because transaction fees. And I don't know. I was going to try it. I was just going to do it, um, but I'm afraid that if, like, someone were to buy one, then um, I'm stealing your stuff, and I don't want to do that. Um, I don't know if you have an Ethereum address. I can send you one if you guys want to send me a message in the chats or something. Or because um, if I don't hear from you, I'm going to make it. But I don't want to steal your product. Um, I can give you all the profits if you want. I was wanting to know if, if I kind of doubt anybody will buy one. And it's so niche. Nobody will know it's there. But anyway, it's <laughs> just... Uh, GrandMakerAmerica.com. Uh, I'm going to buy you guys. Um, I'm going to make them either way. I just might not just... You just got to email rate. Graham. Next message. I got his email. Did you? Yeah, we talked about it a Greetings little bit. From uh, oh. from Southeast Georgia. Just wanted to tell you guys I uh, really enjoy the show. Uh, you give me a lot to think about during my my long drives, and uh, keep doing what you're doing. You all take care. Bye. Thanks, guys, for Thanks. the email or for the voicemails. To erase this message erased. Yeah, we'll End talk about that other messages. one. I mean. Our only con our main concern is just the quality reduction and stuff, and 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 selling something at a reduced quality. I mean, it's it's a good idea. I mean, we could explore it uh, at some point. But Darren and I will talk about it, and I'll, we'll get back to you. We'll figure it out. All right, you want to do a quote, and we'll get out of here. No, let's uh, let's do this because this is a cryptid app episode with Lauren Coleman. Let me give me the oh, let me give a chord. I'm going to give you a play a quote. I'm going to give you a chord. <clears throat> We're going to skip the the operation project for this week because of your operation project. That you talked about. And I'm going to play uh, from How to Hunt. Okay, let's hear it. And then I got a quote. And then we're done. Okay. Sasquatch or Bigfoot as they are known today are the Nephilim of the past and one of the four types of humans that exist today. Humans, Sasquatch, red-haired giants, and the Bajekifzanes. Bajekifzanes. <laughs> Bracket, small grays. Bracket. Ooh. Sasquatch were amongst the first humans abducted by the Zetas, extraterrestrials, and had changes made to the nuclear DNA for the purpose of hard slave labor. All Sasquatch originated from the area north of the Black Sea, about 400 miles north of Egypt. This original group were all Caucasian. Sasquatch do have names they call themselves and subtle appearance differences depending on what geographical location they are from and this global. 
I'm going to explain in detail the group that occupies the western half of North America. This is the group with us now. This group called themselves the Almas people and have corresponding native language. All of them have a very good understanding of English. They do have a written language, basically symbolism for Almas at best. All Sasquatch around the world understand the local human language because they are exposed to it through the Zetas. Zetas, Zetas, however you want to pronounce it. Zetas. Zetas? Yeah, probably Zeta Reticuli. We don't need to listen to the rest of that. Nah, that's that's probably not like, appropriate for Lauren. Lauren's got a museum with uh, all kinds of... I don't know. They're not, I, that's a little bit, probably a little bit interdimensional for our yeah, chat with for Lauren. Sure. <laughs> all right, let's hear I your like quote. it, though. All right, <clears throat> I just flipped it open. This is the Octopus of Global Control. And you know what? A journalist has been popping up lately that I would say has been somewhat red-pilled to at least how bad the media and journalism is these days. So I'm giving you a hint on who it is. Contemporary guy. He's, he's in, he's in the, the milieu these days. And this is about... Uh, let me just give you some context. This is from the chapter on the emergence of the economic hitman. These crimes were so obvious that apparently the cartels in Mexico specifically designed boxes to put cash in them so they would fit through the windows of HSBC teller or fit through the windows of HSBC teller windows. Glenn Greenwald. Close. We can do a second guess. Oh, I don't have another guess. Right, right there with him as far as like a good journalist who's kind of pushing back against the mainstream. The dead right one? No. Nope. Hmm. I don't know. Matt. Belair? Taibi? Uh, no way I would have got that. Matt Taibi. Huh. I should have got that. Anyways. Anyways. That's it. Thanks for putting up with our lazy ramblings. Yeah. Enjoy the fantastic chat with Crypto Lauren. Tonight we've got Lauren Coleman with us. We've wanted to talk to Lauren for many years. You can see the Sasquatch Seven. prints on her on her wall and everything. Lauren's been a researcher in uh, cryptozoology for a while, writer, lots of books. Cryptozoo News, great blog over there. And uh, it's got news of the International Cryptozoology... Oh, i got to say that right. Cryptozoology ah. Museum, the world's only cryptozoology museum. And uh, yeah, we want to talk about that for sure. So thanks for uh, joining us, Lauren. Well, it's great to be here. Yeah. I don't know. Where do you want to start? There's so much, but uh, I think that... I think we should address Dvorak. Yes, let's do that. Yeah, yes. claim. That. Yes. How do you pronounce cryptozoology? Because the way I say it like that, apparently that's wrong. We've been told that's wrong and it should be cryptozoology. Because there's cryptozoology. Cryptozoology. Three, three O's. Yeah. Some people say cryptozoology. Like there's a zoo in it. Yeah, that's what I do. But yeah, but it's more cryptozoology. That's right. Zoology. Okay, okay. Like the subject. Okay. <laughs> how about again. how about the, the name of the fish that's our logo? That's oh, I can't. I was one. I was going to ask you about that. I, I listened. <laughs> I read your blog on it. And I I Koana Kalf, Koana Kalf no, or something. Seal Seal 
Now you don't. Coelacanth. Coelacanth. And what, and what is that? Is that like a dinosaur <laughs> fish that they found uh, in, in the 20th century? Well, they talk about it as the dino fish because it became extinct in um, 65 million years ago. And uh, then they came across to a pile of fish a museum director did in South Africa, in East London, South Africa, and discovered it in 1938, rediscovered it in 1938 since they knew it from uh, fossils. And so it's a darling of cryptozoology uh, in terms of the locals knew about it, they ate it, um, they put a lot of spices on it because it, it didn't taste good, but they um, certainly, we talk about it like a, a giant panda, the mountain gorilla, the okapi. These are different things that indigenous people knew about, but then Western science discovered later. Right. And is it is it also important because it's an eight, it's a, it's a dinosaur fish that there's only so many of these things that are still living now or that are still there. Is that also part well, of it? It was called the living fossil. It's called the um, Lazarus uh, species because it's one that became extinct and was refound. Uh, it's called a dino fish, fish because it was only known from the age of the dinosaurs. So uh, all of those kinds of things. It's a, uh, it's very endangered. It's a deep sea fish, uh, but we really don't know how many are out there because it's so hidden. Is it pretty big? Uh, yes. The one I have, uh, the only model of one, a replica of the first one found in 1938, and it's five and a half feet long. Uh, they can get to be six feet long. So a lot of people were really struck by it when they come in and see this model of the fish, and they always thought the coelacanth was very small. Uh, but it's, it's quite uh, amazing to take it in. Hmm. So what about the other thing you have in the uh, museum, that skeleton, that nine-foot skeleton? Is that, is that uh, something new to your museum? Yeah, we just uh, had the acquisition of uh, uh, Chris Murphy's Sasquatch Revealed. And that's uh, it's actually been around the country. It's a traveling exhibit. It uh, started about 14 years ago out on the West Coast in British Columbia and Washington State and different places like that. And we, we've been talking to them for a few years. And it would pop around and stay in a, a museum for maybe, um, you know, 18 months or so and then move on. Well, uh, Chris is kind of coming to the end of of his real exhibiting of that. And so he's moved it to the museum, and it's uh, probably not going to leave our museum. It's become a, a permanent acquisition. And so we're quite excited by, by it, but it also is a lot of work uh, at, uh, because we're recurating the whole museum to accommodate uh, of this very large collection. And one of the pieces of it that you've seen is the, the nine foot tall uh, human-like skeleton. So that people get some notion of how big Bigfoot is because we actually now have it right, standing up right next to our model of uh, Bigfoot, which is eight and a half feet tall. Um, the skeleton is actually was created in the 1970s by um, a bunch of college students in Arizona, and they uh, made it to show people how how big a nine foot tall human would be. Right. Uh, but but it works for us in terms of the Bigfoot exhibit because it's quite it's all in the same ball yeah. ball game. So that's only been there since the summer, I think. Yeah, just yeah. since the summer, we yeah. brought that in. Uh, also, a, a large collection of material from a, a man who uh, passed away named Chris Oric. And if you ever uh, read any of my pieces on Crypto Mundo, he was a, a frequent uh, commentator. He would come in and leave lots of comments and uh, criticisms and insights. And he gave... Uh, he, 
he was secretly a, a very wealthy man who uh, went around and collected uh, like coins, postage stamps, uh, artifacts, paintings, all cryptozoological. And his family decided to divide it up and they're, they're selling some parts of it, but they're, they gave a, a big chunk to us, uh, mostly of uh, thylacine or the Tasmanian tiger, uh, the dodo, and uh, some drawings of the okapi and pumas and different cryptids from around the world. Yeah. So it's, uh, that's also being added to the collection and we're recurating. Wow. Now, a lot of people were very negative about the pandemic. And I, I too, you know, know there's a lot of pain with the pandemic, but we always try to look for the bright side. And one of the things that happened during this pandemic over the summer was the restaurant, which was always, uh, there was two restaurants in front of us over time. And we've been in this location since 2015 you know, uh, a venue where there's lots of businesses uh, with the hospitality, uh, you know, a brewery, a distillery, a winery. And the restaurant actually, uh, during the pandemic, uh, had to close down like we did, and they could never really get it together to get up again. They, they were down to, you know, 15 customers a day and losing money, terribly, terrible losses. So what they did is they closed and they went belly up and we took over the space. So we actually, during the pandemic, have expanded the museum by one third. And it's been a, a very successful uh, time for us. Also, we had to face a lot of realities. Uh, we've, we've been in existence for 17 years and we work on a, a month to month kind of existence based upon admissions, a few, you know, maybe one or two donations a month, $10, $25. And then our gift store, bookstore, you know, for uh, souvenirs. And what's happened, um, of course, is we've been forced to take out loans. And that was the first time in 17 years that we, we wanted to go into debt. But it's actually... Uh, I, I sort of feel free yeah. by being in debt. You know, I mean, now we don't have to worry. You know, we can at least worry three, four months ahead because we've got money in the bank. I mean, it's money in debt, but that's better than where we were. So I'm kind of being educated about uh, debt is okay, I guess. I mean, we have a president that's in debt, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, it sometimes works for people. And for a nonprofit business, it seems to be the way to go, yeah. you know. Um, and so that's been enlightening. Yeah. So do you want to talk a little bit more about what's in that? It's it's uh, <clears throat> that Sasquatch Revealed exhibit? Because like you said, it's been traveling all over and now it's there. No, I don't pretty... because you won't come if I tell you everything. <laughs> no, uh, uh, what Chris, Chris, of course, is uh, in British Columbia. So he has focused on. Hey, hey. My dogs. Must be somebody getting close. Anyway, there's a lot from British Columbia with regard to Sasquatch. Yeah, I grew up near uh, near Harrison. I was in. I grew up in Maple Ridge, and we used to go to Harrison Hot Spring for skiing all the time, and we'd go there to hang out. And you know that was that they embraced the Sasquatch there. They had a whole uh, uh, Sasquatch Inn on the way down that you would see, right. and and uh, so it was it was part of the culture back from the sixties, seventies, eighties. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. there in two thousand eleven again. Yeah. Uh, I went up there in 1975 uh, when I did a cross-Canadian uh, cross tour. But in 2011, a lot of us gathered in Harrison Hot Springs to uh, do a tribute to John Green. And one thing I noticed is uh, it seemed to be epicenter of, of Sasquatch. Almost every other corner has a, you know, Bigfoot gas station or a carving of Bigfoot or, 
you can eat in a Bigfoot restaurant. You know, it's all over, and they really have definitely embraced it. Yeah, so, uh, it's a it's a cool place. So anyway, he um, he gathered a lot of information about Sasquatch. There's footprints that uh, cast that uh, we already had 250, but he's added another 40 to the collection. Uh, he has nice labeling, nice historical pr- perspective. He looks at some of the more in, um, important people like John Green, uh, Richard, uh, Roger Patterson, goes over the film. Uh, Chris very much loved the film and, and did big blow-ups of the Patterson film, so we have those all along the wall and uh, placards and, and different uh, art that goes with the native art and uh, sort of primitive paintings of people doing what Bigfoot looks like. As far as artifacts, too, uh, it's all throughout the museum. Nice. And part of uh, the museum, which we already did, but also he does too, is a lot of people don't really understand why we have uh, toys in the museum. But we feel that. Toys are sort of a popular cultural representation of, 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 you know, Western view of these creatures. Just like uh, how anthropologists go around to collect uh, native art or carvings or masks, bead, yeah. yeah, mask, beadwork, stuff like that. Uh, I have for sixty years that I've been doing this. Uh, I've picked up roadside art. Uh, whenever there's a sighting, oftentimes you get uh, different people uh, doing paintings just for that area or a, a, a fluffy toy that only exists for two years, uh, like in Washington State when they did uh, had its uh, 200th birthday, they did little Bigfoot-type creatures. So our museum is filled with evidence, footprints, hair samples, fecal material, but also it's filled with these popular cultural items. Like um, Teenage Ninja Turtles, we have some of those because they really uh, overlap with uh, kappas, which are the Japanese uh, folklore. And so we see that over and over again and with all the different cryptids. Hmm. So the museum's been around 17 years. It's just expanded um what what started it all what what initially got you uh, what led to the to the opening of the museum 17 years ago well um it was my collection and it was in my house and i uh i had just bought a new house i'd gone through another divorce you know been there done that <laughs> and uh I decided to buy a house that was a little bit bigger than what my boys and I needed. Uh, And so I talked to my accountant, I talked to my attorney, and decided to create a museum in my home where the whole first floor was a museum. We would live upstairs, and also we had a room downstairs that we could uh, use as a bedroom. And so I... I slowly started that. I said, uh, you know, if if it's going to happen, it's got to happen some way. So it started, and very quickly, uh, I had people saying, you need a more central location, you know, downtown Portland. Uh, and the other thing was, uh, I, I'm kind of known in the field. I've written a lot of books. I've done a lot of uh, TV shows and podcasts and different things like that. But just because I and some other people in cryptozoology realize that I'm known, that doesn't mean the IRS knows me. But they did know me. They got to know me and they decided to do an audit because I was taking a very small uh, tidbit off of my taxes for having a museum in my house. And they didn't like that. So uh, I fought through six appeals and lawyers and all kinds of different things and decided finally I was getting so deeply in lawyer 
fees that I just decided to do after they had discovered that they owed me money. <laughs> uh, that, then, then we kind of both mutually agreed the solution to this was me to move into a building downtown and open a museum. I've always wanted to have a museum with cryptozoology. I want somebody else to do it, maybe. But I'm always the guy that if uh, it doesn't happen, I go ahead and step forward. So created the museum in it, like I was saying earlier, one thing led to another, and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Because, I mean, you know, you can only show your girlfriends your etching so many times. So, <laughs> <laughs> You think it was really about the taxes? Of course, the, cons- the conspiratorial part of me goes, they're trying to shut you down because they're like, hey, that guy's got all kinds of Bigfoot stuff well, on display. <laughs> well, it was very interesting. My, my uh, accountant and my attorneys had to take all these videotapes and all these books that I'd written and to really prove, because on my taxes, I write down my occupation, cryptozoologist, uh, because that's what I am. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, uh, it was just that's a long, automatic hard audit. <laughs> Pardon me? That's probably an auto audit. It, it could have been, but they fought me like it was, you know, targeted. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't feel, I didn't ever feel narcissistic or, um, you know, paranoid about it. I just knew that I had to fight it. Yeah. And one thing that uh, they, that my accountant discovered is that since I'd passed the age of 59, they were still charging me for taxes that they should have dropped off a long time ago. So it was nice discoveries of things. <laughs> so and have you had any problem with the IRS since in the museum regard? No, no. no. I, I always hire accountants that are ex IRS agents. It go. seems to work well. <laughs> so I wanted to get into uh, <clears throat> the definition of cryptozoology. And did I say it right? It's a little better. Cryptozoology. Right? Zoology. Um, That's all right. Because, like, I was thinking about uh, how far this has come in the last five or ten years, or at least maybe because we're pod- we've been podcasting for almost eight. I don't know if that's got anything to do with it because we're more involved, but it really feels like it's opening up to everybody. This is just every. It's more accepting. It's more. Uh, approachable for people. And, uh, but what's the difference between like you talked about, I read some of your blogs and you really had a good definition of like, once it's found and it's known, it's no longer a crypto, but what's the difference between some of the stuff that you have in your museum, some of the, the, the real crypto stuff and like a saber tooth tiger or something that was, you know, that we have bones from, from the, you know, before the, the end of the ice age type thing. Well, there's, there's various divisions in the cryptozoology museum. You have, for instance, there's lots of cryptids as we call them evidence for them, uh, cultural folklore related to that. What you're talking about are the antecedent or candidate animals and species that may be relevant to a cryptid. In other words, um, I've done a lot of investigations across the United States of black panthers. Right. Black panthers are more frequently seen than Bigfoot. Uh, and it's so frequently seen. Where, where's your show coming from? Uh, Calgary, close to Calgary, Alberta. Oh, really? Okay. So, you know, it, all in that area, you have black panthers, mystery cats, um, and yet in your area, there's real mountain lions. And so that's, that's a, an existing species that might be confused for a mystery animal. Right. And so we're always interested in knowing the nature and natural world wherever there's a sighting. But also, like with the Black Panther reports, there seems to be some connection to them having some link to what's called Panthera atrox, which is a prehistoric Pleistocene, last ice age animal that may be still surviving. So wow. we're interested in surviving fossil forms. Right, right. So we have fossils in the museum that may relate to some of those creatures. 
Then we also have fakes and gaffes and hoaxes, a little small section, especially useful if you're taking a, a school group around to really heighten the idea that cryptozoology is also about critical thinking. I'm very skeptical of lots of the stories we hear, lots of the sightings and people, but people generally are not trying to hoax you. Hoaxes are about 1% of all the cases, but they're about 90% of what the media wants to talk to you about. Yep. So, uh, you know, it's very slanted towards the media comes along. They want a story that they have a beginning, a middle, and an end. So they love hoaxes because they can talk about how mysterious it is and they can sell newspapers and get their ratings up. And then they can, in nine days, say, oh, it's nothing but a dog. You know, it wasn't a wolf man. It wasn't a Bigfoot. It was a dog. Uh, and that happens over and over again. In your area, uh, I wrote a whole book with uh, Mark Hall called True Giants. And there's a subfield of Bigfoot Sasquatch studies that people don't want to talk about. <laughs> it's of these giant 15 foot to 20 feet tall giants. And there's the Big Horn report from Alberta is a, a Big Horn dam. Uh, sightings of huge creatures that uh, Roger Patterson, John Green would talk about, but they wouldn't write about. So in that book, I, I quote them, I quote their cases. We look at that. And we look at these kinds of uh, true giants, as we call them, all around the world. And there's something going on there. It's just that uh, I'm a radical within a radical field. Sometimes people don't want to hear what I have to say. <laughs> so what what is it about? Because giants are the other thing. I mean, it seems to be in the last five or ten years. They're being more accepted. There's more and more evidence so coming back, out. Yeah. Back to your original question. Why is the field opening up? Well, the population's getting larger. More people are getting interested in this. There's more shows on TV. Uh, the end of the 90s was a skeptical debunking time. Yep. And so you had the explosion in the 60s. You can kind of start thinking about this. Then in the 70s and 80s, you had lots of books, lots of TV shows, and people started getting interested. The, documentaries on TV would feed the books. The books then would create people that wanted to do documentaries, and it got to be a cycle. In the 90s, it started contracting. But now we're exploding again. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's happening in all fields. Yeah. Uh, but there is, there is a, some very subvertive uh, things going on. You have what are called the guerrilla skeptics. Have you heard about yeah, them? Yeah, yeah. And they're, they're invading Wikipedia. Yeah, yeah. And if you write, a, write something about Bigfoot, they'll jump right in there and they'll call it a pseudoscience. They'll put negative stuff in there. And uh, almost any subject that is not mainstream, they think it's their God-given duty to you know, try to... Uh, downplay everything in that article. So I figure they're not worth it uh, worrying about, uh, except for high school students who uses Wikipedia for papers anyway. Yeah. I feel like it's only a matter of time because more and more people have had genuine experiences and more and more people know somebody that they love that have had a, you know, a paranormal or a cryptid or a UFO, right. UFO type experience. And you can only hold that, that back for so long before people start just accepting that there's another reality there for people. Yeah. I mean, even if you don't become a true believer in the other reality, you should at least always keep an open mind Yeah, that we don't have all the answers. And if we really, uh, if you get into the mindset that you're going to uh, tell everybody all of the answers, then kind of your life is over. Uh, doesn't have much room for any movement into new possibilities. How did you get into becoming a cryptozoologist? I mean, that's not something your high school guidance counselor was recommending or 
<laughs> you know, and, and there wasn't, it must have been a weird foray to sort of get into at the time. Yeah, well, I mean, I, you got to realize I was born in 1947. So uh, when I was growing up in the 1950s, it was pretty, you know, Eisenhower and Nixon was the vice president. It was a very shut down time. You know, it was pretty repressed. And I grew up in a Midwestern city with a firefighter father and a housewife mother uh, in which I was supposed to grow up and work in a factory. You know, that's what everybody in blue collar Decatur did. Well, I, um, I was 12 years old. I loved science fiction films. I didn't necessarily like to read science fiction because everything I read was nonfiction, uh, natural history books. So along comes this movie, One Friday Night. Uh, actually, it was March 20th, 1960, and it was Half Human, a Japanese film by Shiro Hondu. Uh, and I don't know if you know that name, but uh, or even have heard of the movie Half Human. It was his second science fiction film he ever made. His first science fiction film was a little number called Godzilla. <laughs> He was, he was very famous for Godzilla. Uh, Half Human, hardly anybody's heard of. His third movie was Rodan. And so he was, you know, our powerhouse filmmaker. And Half Human was about these hairy creatures, which I would find out later were like Yetis. Uh, and they were being hunted down by, um, by the Japanese. And the villagers there, which were uh, based on the Ainu, uh, the tribal, the indigenous people of Japan, they would beat on them in the movie, and they would torture them and mistreat them. Because I guess that's what, in 1958 to 1960, was allowed in the films. Well, soon after I watched the film, uh, that film was banned. That's why I could never see it again, so to speak, because it had been banned in Japan as too, uh, you know, negative towards indigenous people. Anyway, I saw it that Friday night, got up, I had a TV station in Decatur that, where I actually got up and was able to watch the movie again. And uh, not to say I was brainwashed, but I, I certainly was fascinated by this creature that I'd never read about in any of the nature books that I was reading. And it wasn't just one abominable snowman. Uh, it was a family of them with a little kid and uh, the Japanese hunters shoot the kid and try to bring it back to a carnival and all that. So I went to my teachers on Monday and I said, what is this about these abominable snowmen? And they gave me three answers. Leave me alone. Get back to your studies. They don't exist. <laughs> so that made me into a cryptozoologist because I was so fascinated to find out what was going on here. Uh, there weren't that many books written on them because cryptozoology was not even in the English language then. And the word that was used was romantic zoology. So I found two or three books about romantic zoology and read everything I could about Yetis, about Loch Ness Monster, uh, about things like that. And a year after I got interested, uh, I and also 1960 was the year that Sir Edmund Hillary went to the Himalayas uh, trying to find the Yeti. He actually was trying to debunk Yeti, and he was on a spy mission against the Chinese. <laughs> but uh, I was only able to learn that when I grew up. and did research on a book. But um, what, what was fascinating to me was a year after I uh, got interested, Ivan T. Sanderson wrote his book called A Bondable Snowman, A Legend Come to Life. And I, uh, I took the book, literally put it in front of me, went through the, each page, 
and took out everybody's name and wrote to them all over the world. Wow. And got 400 correspondents. Wow. As well as being a full-time correspondent with Bernard Hoivemans and Ivan D. Sanderson. And start doing field work for them, uh, looking for some stuff they were looking for. Um, like the Iceman started tracking down Hanson. So much so that when I was 21 and asked to speak in Washington, D.C., uh, at a conference, I walked into the conference and everybody thought I was in my mid 40s <laughs> because I'd been doing so much in the field. Remember back when we only wrote letters and you didn't hear from people for two weeks? So uh, you occasionally would make calls to people, but it's unbelievable how much contact and how hard it was to contact people. I mean, you- now I can. Me. Would you have written more books or do you think you would have had a podcast or do you think you would have approached it different if you were just coming into the, to the, to the practice today? Cause that's kind of like where we were coming from, you know, we just had, had want to talk to all these people all over the world. And if we had a podcast, it lent us just enough credibility. <laughs> well, I think that I, I kind of got, I'm old enough now to see that I was very lucky. A lot of the founders of the field are dying or have already died, and I knew them. And so I got to be in the second wave for the second generation of cryptozoologists uh, that was there when that happened. Or, I mean, if you've seen any of um, Seth Breedlove's films. Yep. You'll notice a lot of it's in the 1970s. Well, I was there. I was there. I was investigating this. I was hitchhiking to Mississippi from college instead of going to class. You know, I was I, I was doing stuff like that, uh, and that was important. So then I wrote my books based upon my real field work, actually being there talking to people about Mothman, talking to people about Momo, being in California. I went to live in California for two and a half years and met all of these Bigfoot people like Jim McLaren, different people that were just getting into the field out there. And so I feel very blessed uh, by my um, my experiences and, and who I met. So you're a legit, like, full-time, all-your-life cryptozoologist. Oh, yes, yes. I, um, I have written 40 books, co-wrote them or wrote them, and I've um, written chapters or introductions to another 60. So I've been connected to, like, 101 books. And uh, for many, many years, I would do cryptozoology on the side, uh, I got a graduate degree in psychiatric social work and worked in mental hospitals and with runaway kids to support myself until I could get to the place of, um, you know, after several divorces and losing money, uh, to actually be able to have a little bit of social security, be able to make a little bit money on the side that you can add to the social security and I do this full time. I've been doing and then teaching courses at university in cryptozoology and documentary film because I made documentary films, too. Uh, and I, I've done a lot of, uh, you know, a little bit of conspiracy stuff because I'm interested in in how people's minds work around that. Uh, but I, I've had many different careers with cryptozoology kind of on the side. But. Seriously, since uh, 19, well, really, for all of the two, 2000s, I've been doing cryptozoology only. Yeah. So how does, you, speaking of the sort of the the psycho- psychological part, or you mentioned being, you know, skeptical and have to, you know, think critically about all this. Was there a point when your belief system changed or was there any any sort of 
adjustments or, you know, how did you, because obviously you're, you're interested in it right away, but I don't, that doesn't mean you necessarily believe in it right away or did like, did that, how did that, your, your belief system evolve with, with your research over the years? Well, I think changing from my parents' point of view helped a lot. Uh, I, uh, my father was in the Navy my brother, a younger brother, was drafted into the army and served in Vietnam. So I, I had that military family, you know, nephews, uncles were police officers, military people, firefighters, a kind of a, a rigid yet serving the community kind of point of view. Well, I took it a different way. I uh, as soon as I got to college, I immediately was drawn to anthropology because I wanted to have room in my brain to put myself in other people's shoes, to not just think my way is the highway. You know, I, I wanted to, and I did that with cryptozoology. I would never go into an investigation with preconceived notions about well, if they like, like I saw in one program once where a, a Bigfooter is standing this close to the uh, another uh, eyewitness who's saying, but Bigfoot's face was black. And the researcher's shouting ba- back at him, no, Bigfoot's face is never black. You know, and I just could never see doing that with an eyewitness. I wanted to really empty my brain to hear what people wanted to tell me and really be non-judgmental. In fact, um, people in the media would always say, do you believe in Bigfoot? And I'd say, stop right there. I never use the word believe. I accept or deny the reality of any situation. I investigate a situation. But the people that I do not like to have on expeditions with me are two types. True believers, because they hear everything in the woods is a Bigfoot, or the debunkers, because a debunker won't even have any room in their cosmos to take in the possibilities. So, you know, I I feel like I can be openly minded and yet skeptical or skeptically open minded all the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, What's your favorite crypto? Yeah, I was going to ask that. Yeah. Uh, well, you know what they say about I'm a very romantic person. And so the Yeti will always be my favorite because it was my first love. But uh, have you ever heard of the Dover Demon? Yep. The Dover Demon. Yeah. That does sound familiar. Did we talk about that with Seth? No, I don't think so. No. That was uh, a creature that was seen, it was bright orange. Uh, seen climbing along a wall in Dover, Massachusetts, in April of 1977. Well, I did that investigation, and I actually coined the name, the Dover Demon. Um, because I'm a writer, I've, I've coined a lot of names coincidentally with my writing, because whenever I investigate something, I create a file. But I used to have real paper files. And Dover Demon, Phantom Clowns, Phantom... Panthers, um, you know, all these names that uh, you might hear, I napes, which are the little apes in the woods. Are, those are all names I created that have kind of gone into cryptozoology. So the Dover Demon very much is a favorite of mine because it's so unexplained. And I don't know what it was. I really don't. Maybe it was, a, you know, something related to a, uh, you know, goblins, maybe chupacabras, maybe mer- merbings, I don't know. It was seen along a creek, uh, four sightings all in a straight line, if you look on a map, uh, and just about four feet tall, kind of like the Pudgewedgies. Interesting. We had a we had a, another podcaster on the show last week, and he was talking about his encounter in the, in the swampy woods been camping and he heard this crazy howl and when he looked back he had 
found uh, all these other instances of uh, campers and hikers. Uh, I think they had seen Dog Man and, and stuff like that oh, yeah, around, around, Man, that, around yeah. that area. And, and it made me think about how, like, or, do you have any overarching uh, theories or like the, the dog man seems like, you know, there's an Egyptian God Anubis with a dog head. Like Anubis? a lot of these, what's that? Isn't it Anubis? Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Anubis. You know, isn't, isn't a lot of these, it's interesting that a lot of these gods are part, part human, part animal. And yet you're still seeing these contemporary uh, reports on sightings. Like, do you think there's any connection to some of these possibly go back that far or is it a completely different phenomenon? Well, I think that ancient folklore is like new folklore. It comes from someplace. Uh, and a lot of the legends definitely seem to be related to something that people are, are seeing. Uh, one of the things that I think a lot of the more modern researchers do awful quickly is they come up with a theory before they have too much evidence. Right. Uh, I know Linda Godfrey really well. I like her. We've been together in lots of conferences, but I've always been skeptical of dogmen because some of the early reports I heard sounded like Bigfoot that were uh, bending down on the roads eating roadkill. And then people would get all excited, you know, on Bray Road, Wisconsin, and say, oh, there's dogman, there's dogman. And it would go very much to the werewolf folklore. Right. Uh, and so, uh, and then it became a phenomenon. And then it became a conference. And then it becomes a, a, you know, a quick documentary. And I think it loses any notion of solid evidence. You know, where's the footprints? Where's the fecal material? Where are the hair samples? So my overarching place in cryptozoology has always been biological. Uh, I'm not into fourth dimensional creatures. I'm not into, you know, uh, Bigfoot jumping out of UFOs or anything. I know there's lots of people with lots of theories, and I figure that's fine for them. I'm really here to, to occupy the middle with biological and anthropological uh, information to to say, well, this could be in this realm. But I, I mean, you know, there's also some, some real fringe people that are into woo-woo so much, like, like him. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, I think it, it uh, I, I'm very much uh, a follower of Ivan T. Sanderson, who once told me, never try to explain one unknown with another unknown. And that's kind of been my, my saving grace in terms of whenever I kind of find myself going too far out on the edge. I loved his book on uh, underwater, underwater flying saucers. I think it was USO. Yeah, USOs. USOs. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. And since he was in uh, uh, ONI, I mean, he was in British intelligence for the Navy. Uh, and I think it's interesting he had he had a lot of back channel information uh, and put some of that in the book. Yeah. Wow. Well, I'll get in crap if I don't ask you <laughs> this question, <laughs> since we've got a whole like product line and stuff going on. And because I've always been an advocate of if I'm out in the bush with my rifle and a Bigfoot wanders along, maybe one should be shot to prove the species and protect it and put this debate to bed once and for all. And, and Graham is very anti so we'd have to ask the world's foremost cryptozoologist if he would condone shooting or not shooting Bigfoot. No, I don't. I'm in a, a firmly in the no-kill camp uh, uh, for a variety of reasons. One, I'm a vegan, and I really don't, uh, don't like to eat meat and don't like to kill animals. Uh, the other thing about your whole notion of kill it and they'll prove it is that you're going to shoot somebody with a suit on one of these days. That's so Graham says too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's, there is real possibility that the first one that shot, even if it's not a human in a suit, it could, you could get into the trouble of a local law enforcement 
saying that this is a Native American <laughs> that's just, you know, got lots of hair on it. Because without DNA samples, you could be uh, shooting a new branch of human beings that we don't know about yet. Um, I'd be, that's kind of what I say is like you're going to look at it in the eye and you're not mm -hmm. going to be able to shoot it. I mean, you hear those stories of all the hunters that just can't even. It's more of like a, you know, you're a man. You know, you're trying to you underestimate my resolve. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, also there's a a lot a lot of times uh, people that go deeper in the woods, they start noticing that some of these Bigfoot and the men and women, males and females are doing sexual activity and you might get freaked out by that. How could you shoot them as they were doing making love? Yeah, there mm -hmm. you go, Darren. Yeah, interrupting. Interrupting. Well, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't shoot them if they were making love. I mean, I'm not a monster. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you said you wanted to prove. <laughs> then I'll just steal the baby. <laughs> Victimless wait, crime. Wait, wait around nine months, right? Is that what I wonder if the gestation would be the same? No, yeah, we don't know. Do you think so? Since you probably know most of the cryptids and where they sort of think, do you think now Bigfoot's your favorite? Which one? Yeti, is there any Yeti. or Yeti? Yeti, Yeti? Yeti. Do you think there's one that's going to be like, um, like blow the whole thing open? Or one thing, that's or? just like just a matter of time until we find one? Like one that's just really pushing the envelope, other than obviously the fish, which would be a well, good example of that. I wrote a book called uh, The Field Guide to Bigfoot and Other Mystery Primates. And in that book, I, I put a list of best bets, ones that will probably be discovered. The Bigfoot's far down on the list because you don't have in Canada or North or um, United States much financial support for the kind of expeditions that we used to have a hundred years ago, where people would go out for six months, they would talk to the local people and they would really live in the woods until they could find these animals. You have six pack Joes going out for weekends, thinking they're going to discover Bigfoot in three days. And they're lucky if it's a four day holiday, right? So, so anyway, you know, I wish them all luck, but I think the the one that's going to be discovered first is the Rang Pindek, which is in Sumatra, and it's a little four foot tall creature. There's uh, been scientists that have seen those uh, good footprints, and I think those will be the ones. Uh, as far as the humanoids, as far as um, other kind of cryptids, the um, the ones that are in the ocean, we're probably going to see a flourish of activity. We already know there's dolphins out there that are unknown that are going to be discovered in the next 25 years. The way that dolphins, new dolphins, beaked, beaked dolphins are, are found are beachings uh, on shorelines because they hardly ever find new ones in the ocean. And then there's lots of birds and lots of turtles and uh, i mean they found a brand new bird in central park new york they found a, a a king crayfish in a river in tennessee it was twice as big as the known crayfish they found a new uh, turtle in the uh, pearl river in mississippi so they're finding new animals all the time and uh is it, i think what when everybody ask me about what's going to be found. They're always usually talking about the celebrity cryptids. Yeah. You know, Bigfoot, Yeti, Loch Ness, Loch Ness Monster, yeah. Champ, you know, some lake monster in Quebec, Ogopogo, something like Ogopogo that. Ogopogo out here. Yeah, Ogopogo, right. Or Caddy, Caddy off of the coast. Uh, but I don't think any of the big ones, the big celebrities, are going to be found right away. Uh, they almost by their very status. I mean, Sasquatch is held up to such high proof that it's going to be hard for anybody to, you know, let's... Need a body. Let's, um, what, Darren? <laughs> need a body. <laughs> yeah, need a body. Even though Grover Kranz said, 
you know, if you shoot one, he, he was, you know, advocate. He said, shoot one and cut its head off, you know, so because the whole body would be too heavy for you to bring out of the woods. But you'd come out of the woods with the head, everybody run far away. Or the foot. The foot, yeah. As long as you could, you know, make sure that there was hair on it, right? Because you could cut a person's foot off and make a Take large hair person. on it. Could be a basketball player. They wouldn't know. <laughs> How big are your feet? They're not very big. What about uh, some of those dinosaur type ones? Like, is the Michaelium Bembe one that uh, they seem to be quite accepted by the the local community? Well, Michaelium and Bembe is certainly a, a possibility. The one fallacy with the Michaelium and Bembe is that almost all of the the amateur cryptozoologists that talk about it, I think it's a living dinosaur. But the closer you get to the evidence, it's probably an unknown aquatic rhino. And that is a possibility. A mammal, some kind of unknown mammal in deepest, darkest Africa probably still exists. And also South America. Um, You know, like there's reports of a, a different kind of cat, maybe a saber tooth cat down in South America. That would be exciting. Mm. Very exciting. The humanoid one, I feel like, would be exciting, too. What, what do you mean? Which, which one? The one... Uh, the one that you're going to shoot? No, not the one I'm going to shoot. <laughs> um, the one uh, you had mentioned, the humanoid, I forget where, down oh, in... The Rang Pindek? Yeah. 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 Oh, that would be exciting. I was just talking about the non-humanoids for a minute. How humanoid are they? Like, are they like... Well, uh, they they mm-hmm. walk upright, uh, and they seem to have some kind of ability for thought and communication. They're not a monkey. They're not an orangutan. They seem to be a little bump up in terms of humanness. Yeah, I guess that's what I was meaning more more than humanoid is humanness. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, you know the hobbits that were discovered, the Homo forensis. forensis yeah, yeah. Yeah. That seems to be related to the Rang Pindek, and I think that that for many of us was like a verification that there are we people yeah. that actually did exist. Did leprechauns exist? Maybe. You know, people like to make fun of them. But they could have been a real part of our, our past history. Uh, and, and that there's been these reports of little people on like Sri Lanka, on the Philippines, in Indonesia, Sumatra. So that's quite exciting. It got confirmed a few years ago that there were really fossil little people out there. And we can't make fun of all those people that said they they saw him a hundred years ago. Yeah, yeah. What about the uh, theories about military uh, experiments kind of gone wrong or like hybrid type things? I mean, is that all a part of? Is that a fairly big part of the the whole crypto no, thing it's, as it's well? Very small. Yeah, very small. It's a. I did a, a whole article about twelve years ago on hybrids. Uh, there are hybrids, you know, different bear hybrids, different uh, crossing of different big cats, uh, but they're they're mostly identified. They're in zoos. Uh, there's species that never overlap the ranges, uh, so most of the sightings aren't of hybrids. They're of uh, animal that's completely outside uh, what's known. And I think one of the two of you said, you know, once something's discovered, it's no longer part of cryptozoology. It becomes part of zoology. But that doesn't mean we're not interested in them. Like, no copy. (laughs) What did you mean by the the overlapping? Uh, You mentioned something about the hybrids not overlapping. The, the big cats. In other words, they're having crosses between lions and tigers, and they usually uh, are actually exist in ranges 
that where their interbreeding would not naturally happen. Okay. So, so they're really not part of the equation of cryptozoology. Okay. People like to talk about them because they always uh, feel like, well, it's got to be a hybrid because it's such a weird description for this animal. It's the weird part of weird animal science. Yeah. Well, Lauren, right. before we uh, before we wrap it up, where's the uh, where's the best place for our listeners to track you down on social media, or your website, or your YouTube, and all that stuff if they want to get more cryptids and more Lauren Coleman and the museum too, for sure. Yeah. Well, um, you know, if they're actually not boycotting Google, Google still works for me. Uh, <laughs> Lauren Coleman is pretty easy to find on the internet. I'm all over it, and. Uh, my wife is coming home and redecorating the front room. So nice. don't be distracted by it. Uh, you can go to the museum website, which is cryptozoologymuseum.com, and look at those pages to find where we're at in Portland, Maine. And then on one of the pages, it has the email for how to contact the museum. And through the museum, you can contact me. But... I am on Twitter at uh, Crypto Lauren, and I'm on Facebook and a, a variety of other places like that. So um, I'm pretty easy to find on social media. And the Crypto News as well? Uh, Crypt crypto News, yeah. CryptoNews.com is a blog that I do yeah. uh, quite frequently. Yeah, there's some good uh, stuff in there for sure for people. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And what about the future future plans? Uh, it just uh, focusing on the museum and and the stuff you're working on right now. Well, uh, I mentioned Mark Hall a few times. He died a couple of years ago, but he uh, he left us all of his files and everything. And I'm actually uh, the museum is publishing his Murbeings book. Oh, uh, so I'm doing a new introduction and doing some appendices that uh, will add some new information to it. And that's going to be a, a, a fun thing to do. And then I've got five or six other book contracts I'm trying to get done. Uh, but, you know, Halloween is a, a period of lots of interviews, so I get very tired. So, yeah. But it was exciting being with you guys and yeah. talking about some of this. Yeah, yeah thanks, thanks for yeah. a long time yeah. coming. We appreciate you coming on the show. Hopefully one day we can they'll let us travel again. And we can make our way out to Maine and do a show on location in the museum. That would be yeah. good. Yeah, I'd love to see that museum. And yeah, the last time lobsters. I was in, last time I was in Alberta, I uh, gave a talk at the Royal Alberta uh, Museum. Uh, oh yeah, know, if you uh, end up in Alberta again, definitely let us know, and we'll take you oh, out yeah. of town. Yeah. Oh great! Yeah, you have nice uh, wood bison there. Very rare animal. Yeah, we'll take. We can take you out. We'll take you out for some nice Alberta. Oh, you're a vegan. Never mind. Um, <laughs> I like to see the animals live. <laughs> so don't put it on a plate in front of me, please. Jeez. <laughs> all right. Okay, Lauren. Good thanks. A bunch. All right. Thanks take care. Bye. Have some good holidays. Okay, you, you too. too. Bye -bye. Let us all survive the winter. Yeah. yeah. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye. Take care. And that was our chat with uh, the one and only Lauren Coleman. Uh, world's foremost cryptozoologist. What do you think, buddy? Yeah, it was good. It was fun. It's yeah, been uh, it, it's one of those ones. that's kind of hard to believe we haven't had him on the show in I seven know, and a half years. I know, I know. And, and I was actually looking through our old the old Twitter DMs, and it was actually because we actually had Lauren booked before, and something came up, and he had to cancel, and we just never circled back around. Yeah, uh, well, it's one of those. At, I got the date here. It was. August or yeah, August fourteenth, twenty thirteen. Wow. He said Darren it's... who? <laughs> and I said, Darren Grimes. <laughs> and he said, Darren Grimes hates Saren Crimes. <laughs> <laughs> twenty thirteen. Wow. So that's what, seven, nine, seven years later? Crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard That's to believe crazy, it took yeah. that long to come back you know, around to it. I just doing the research for that just it just makes me 
realized that going through his blogs and all the old, the, he referenced a whole bunch of old books with all the different, like the Dover Demon and all when these different monsters. When he said Mundo. There's so many of those monsters and the different cryptos. It makes me just wonder what's going on in reality, in life. Like how, how many of those are real? I can't believe he's still straddling this line of like, eh, you know, he's, he's in the middle. Doesn't really say one way or the other, you know? When he talked about Cryptomundo, it made me think yeah. of all those old Mysterious Universe yep. episodes of them telling those like cryptid encounter stories from Cryptomundo and stuff like that. Man, I can use a fix of that one day. I should download some some uh, MU. Yep. I actually seen Ben. I was I seen some Ben Grundy content somewhere today. Maybe on Twitter. Who are you thumbing up? No, oh, just Aaron's putting the support link in there. Good Thanks, old buddy. Aaron. Thanks Remember for the time he accidentally up, donated like four hundred dollars. Keep going, stuff. <laughs> that was an experience. Right on, hey, Ron, Good to have you. And no, I, like he, I think somebody's commenting on my like what is really going on. Like I feel like I feel like there's the world is full of monsters and vampires might be real. Dragons. I mean, Dungeons and Dragons come to life. Like when I was a kid. I used to play D and D, thinking it was all f just a game. It was all fake, you know. Now you realize hobbits are real, giants are real, dragons, magic. I mean, it's all there. It's all there. Wow, you've come so far. <laughs> <laughs> if you got a little value from this podcast and uh, you'd like to let us know what the podcast worth to you, if it adds some value to your life. You know, got you through a uh, commute, whatever it got you through. What's that worth to you? Is it worth a cup of coffee, a magazine, cable subscription, movie? You let us know. Grammarica.ca slash support. If you can, when you can, you can do a monthly. That'd be fabulous. It's really the only support we got. We don't do zombies. Sponsor. Forgot zombies. About zombies? Yeah. What about zombies? There's all, they're all over the place. They're all. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Sorry to interrupt your That's like, no, I don't mind. I don't mind. Support the show, please. Before the zombies get us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> angels, demons, aliens. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Could it be that all these things have just been proven or of your, like, standards of proof just dropped? No, no. Uh, dude, hey, like, enough has happened to me personally. That you're just all in on everything? No, but I mean, I'm I mean, open. I'm open. Just about I'm everything. open. I'm <laughs> open. <laughs> werewolves? <laughs> werewolves, too. I mean... <laughs> There's a good good quote from a book I was reading a while back that was uh, the problem with an open mind that's too open is it's like an open sore prone to infection and festering. Huh. Eh? And a closed one is prone to shrinking, <laughs> shrinking, <laughs> shrinkage. I don't know. They just need to get the extra fluoride in there and it just contains it nice. Yeah. Anyway, big thanks to Lauren for coming on the show. Big thanks to you guys for listening, uh, putting up with us. Big thanks to you guys for supporting. If you do, if you don't, you should. GrandMarket.ca slash support. We love you. Be kind to each other. Thanks for listening. And we will see you next week. So many
Hailstorm damage got you blue, sunburn gets you let down, while well, introducing the new Gem Trails. Gem Trails are a convenient new chemtrail that we plow through your sky to ensure you with the haziest and non blue sky that you could have. Gem Trails. Choose from our variety of geo engineered aerosols loaded with toxic chemicals. Some chemicals may include. Barium, strontium 90, aluminum, cadmium, zinc, viruses of all sorts and varieties, and chafe, which actually looks like snow, but may actually be fibers coated with aluminum, desiccated blood cells, plastic, and paper. All chemtrails can be conveniently customized for your needs. Just ask our friend here, James Cruz. Gemtrails. James Cruz ordered the barium, strontium 90, and the chafe. And the chafe he chose was desecrated blood cells in plastic. Gem trails. So I'm sitting in my backyard getting sunburned constantly, and I hear this ad come on the radio. Gem trails. Gem trails. And what they can do for you is amazing. For 33 payments of $333. Gem Trails. No more sunburn. Thanks, Gem Trails. Gem Trails. Thanks, Gem Trails. <coughs> Gem Trails. That's right, James. For 33 easy payments of $330, you too can have a hazy sky with zero sun and zero sunburn. With a brand new technology coming straight out of MIT, we fitted an airplane with nozzles and we can come to any area in the world and spray your backyard. Chemtrails. Warning, warning, warning. Symptoms associated with chemtrails include aneurysms, strokes, heart attacks, and cancer. Chemtrails. Other side effects may include irradiated breast milk, anal leakage, jock itch, runny nose, irregular vaginal discharge, glaucoma, heavy metal poisoning, lockjaw, and low sperm count, persistent hacking, coughing, upper respiratory and intestinal distress, pneumonia, extreme fatigue, disorientation, lethargy, dizziness, splitting headaches, elevated arthritis, symptoms, nosebleeds, blah, 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 yada, yada, etc., etc., doctors, blah, 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 uh, death. If you want it, we spray it. So get your gem trails today. Gem Call 1 900 Gray Sky. That's 1 900 Gray Sky. That's 1 900 W E F U C K E D. Thanks, Gem Trails. Gem trails. <laughs> <laughs> 